Every year, tens of thousands of medical students apply for residency through the NRMP match. This is one of the most important times during medical school, as it not only determines where you will complete residency, but also, more importantly, what specialty you will be training in. For some medical students, match day is one of the happiest days of their lives, and for others, not so much. Here are some surprising trends from the 2022 match. This video is sponsored by Doc2Doc, Doc, the personal lending platform designed for doctors by doctors. Visit doctodoclending.com to learn more today. Let's start with a broad overview of the 2022 match. The 2022 main residency match had approximately 47,000 registrants, which is about 1,000 fewer than in 2021. 2022 was the first year since 2003 in which the number of registrants decreased year over year. Out of these registrants, only about 43,000 submitted certified rank order lists and were considered active applicants. A rank order list is essentially a list of students' preferred institutions. So during the match, students submit the residency programs that they've interviewed at in order of preference, and in turn, residency programs create their own ranked lists of the applicants that they've interviewed. If both parties rank each other, then there is a possibility for a match to be made. This is the basis of the main residency match. This list is a binding agreement, meaning if a match comes through, you are committed to attending that residency program. There were approximately 36,000 positions offered in the match, out of which about 34,000 were filled by medical students in the main match. That's a full rate of approximately 94%. That means that out of the 43,000 active applicants, only about 80% matched in the main residency match. Another 2,100 positions were filled through the supplemental Offer and Acceptance Program, or SOAP, giving us a final match rate of approximately 85% and a fill rate of approximately 99.7%. In total, approximately 6,400 active applicants went unmatched in 2022, which constitutes about 15% of the total number of active applicants. All right, so let's break these numbers down further and look at the match rates for MDs, DOs, and International Medical Graduates, or IMGs. The majority of active applicants during the match were US MD students at approximately 19,900 applicants. The PG-1 match rate for USMD seniors was 92.9%, which is similar to the historical average, which usually fluctuates between 92 and 95%. Approximately 49% of matched USMD seniors matched into their first choice program, which is an increase of 2.1% year over year, and 75% matched into one of their top three choices, which is an increase of 2.2% year over year. In 2022, the number of DO students continued to grow. Out of 7,300 active applicants from USDO schools, approximately 6,700 matched into PGY positions, which is a match rate of about 91.3% which is an increase of 2.2% compared to last year. Among all matched USDO seniors, 48% matched into their first choice program, which is an increase of 5.3% year over year, and 77% matched into one of their top three choices, which is an increase of 4.5% year over year. All right, now IMGs. So the match rate for US citizen IMGs was 61%, and for non-US citizen IMGs, it was 58%. For graduates of US MD programs reapplying in 2022, the match rate was approximately 50.5%. These numbers don't quite tell the full story, however. Let's take it a step further and look at the trends at the type of residency programs that each of these types of students matched into. In general, the trend has been that the majority of USMD students tend to specialize, whereas the majority of USDO students and IMGs tend to go into primary care specialties, such as family medicine, internal medicine, and pediatrics. This pattern has remained consistent with the 2022 match. In 2022, only 36% of matched USMD students went into primary care specialties. By comparison, approximately 55% of DO students, 69% of US citizen IMGs, and 71% of non-US IMGs went into primary care specialties. If we look at the more competitive specialties like dermatology or plastic surgery, USMD students filled 80% of dermatology positions and 89.2% of plastic surgery positions. As you can see by these numbers, your choice of medical school is a super important decision in terms of your options for residency. But because of political correctness reasons, this is a reality that many blogs, YouTube, and Instagram accounts either don't know or they're unwilling to tell you. Although it's not impossible to get into a tier one competitive specialty such as plastic surgery or dermatology as a DO or IMG, it is certainly far more challenging compared to USMD applicants. I do plan on covering this topic of the unspoken realities of MD versus DO versus IMG in detail in a future video, so make sure you are subscribed so that you don't miss it. Now let's take a look at some trends among different specialties. Primary care specialties, including family medicine, internal medicine, and pediatrics, had record high numbers of positions and continue to have high fill rates. This is promising, as the AAMC projects shortages of between 18,000 and 48,000 primary care physicians by the year 2034, unless we start taking steps to address 
address the shortage of primary care physicians. In addition, emergency medicine has also shown an increase in the number of positions year over year. This isn't necessarily surprising, as the number of positions offered in the match for EM has grown every year since 1983. But that being said, out of the 2,921 positions offered, only 2,702 were filled which is a 7% decrease from just last year. It's possible that this decreased fill rate may indicate that med students are just less interested in pursuing EM as a specialty. And that's due to multiple reasons. To start, because of the rapid increase in the number of residency spots in recent years, it's actually 28% since 2018 to be exact, many students are concerned about oversaturation within EM. In addition, EM is at greater risk compared to other specialties for mid-level encroachment, which may decrease workforce opportunities for EM physicians post-residency. So instead of an emergency department needing to employ 20 EM physicians to cover all the shifts, they may be able to use 10 EM docs instead, who each oversee one to two mid-levels each and then get the same level of coverage. I discussed this topic in detail on my riskiest specialties video over on the Med School Insiders channel, link in the description. That being said, fill rates alone are not the end all be all in terms of gauging medical student interest in a specialty. So do take this with a grain of salt. Now, speaking of extrapolating data from fill rates, I've seen a number of articles drawing conclusions about competitiveness based solely on a specialty's fill rate. This is problematic because fill rates alone are not sufficient to comment on competitiveness. One such article reported that anesthesiology is now one of the most competitive specialties due to its 99.9% .9 fill rate. But ask any medical student and they will tell you that anesthesiology is far from the most competitive residency to match into. The issue is that fill rates they don't take into account the variety of other factors, including step scores, number of publications, and other data reported by the NRMP. When speaking about competitiveness, people are incentivized to cherry pick the data that serves their agenda. That's why it's not surprising to see an anesthesiologist say that, hey, anesthesia is the most competitive specialty, but in reality, when you look at the culmination of the data, it's a tier five specialty, and tier five being the lowest level of competitiveness. I explained this further on my Why Every Specialty Seems Competitive video. Every two years, the NRMP publishes its Charting the Outcomes of the Match document, which outlines these additional data points. My team has summarized all the official NRMP data into a spreadsheet, which you can find linked below this video. It should be noted that comprehensive data for this most recent 2022 cycle is not yet available, so these rankings may change, However, it is incredibly unlikely that anesthesiology is gonna move from being number 20 on the competitive index to number one. That being said, I do plan to release a comprehensive video covering the updated 2022 data from the NRMP as soon as it becomes available, so make sure you are subscribed. The big takeaway here is that you should not believe any conclusions regarding competitiveness based solely on fill rates. Any conclusions being drawn from fill rates, other than that specialty's fill rate, should be taken with a massive boulder of salt. All right, so with that out of the way, let's talk about the elephant in the room, unmatched medical students. During the 2022 NRMP match, approximately 6,400 active applicants ultimately went unmatched. This means that there are over 6,000 qualified doctors who didn't obtain a residency position. They're gonna have to wait an entire year to reapply before hopefully being able to continue their training. This is the real issue that's preventing us from fixing the physician shortage. There are simply not enough residency positions to accommodate the growing number of medical students. Although there were record numbers of residency positions this year in multiple specialties, it's not enough to keep up with the growing number of medical students. The majority of funding for residency programs comes from Medicare GME funding. However, certain caps on funding imposed in 1997 have largely frozen in place and it's hindered our ability to open new residency programs. This is slowly changing with the recent 2021 Consolidated Appropriations Act, which will have Medicare provide an additional 1,000 funded slots over five years starting in 2023. However, many are concerned that the existing system still does a poor job of facilitating the creation of new residency programs for a variety of other reasons. To start, there are significant costs and risks for the hospitals to establish a residency program with this current funding structure. As such, there's not enough financial incentive for some hospitals to open residency programs. In addition, residency Residents are disproportionately trained in low population growth, high cost states, and metropolitan areas instead of lower cost of living areas. This is a problem because every dollar spent training a resident in a low cost of living state like Georgia goes much further than in a high cost of living state like New York. But despite this, New York trains more than three times as many residents per capita compared to Georgia. So even if we give more funding to residency programs, those funds may not be used efficiently. This is also a consequence of larger teaching hospitals in these metropolitan areas having more more leverage with private insurers to have higher reimbursement rates for residents. Hospitals with good reputations or who have cornered a local hospital market 
They've increased their capacity to raise premiums, since cutting that facility out of the insurer's network isn't really a realistic option. In short, there is less financial risk to start residency programs in these big metropolitan areas, and more risk to start programs in areas that actually have greater limitations in access to care. In addition, the funds generated from increased reimbursement are usually treated as general funds, as opposed to being allocated for purposes of training residents. There's also a mismatch between residents and demand for additional services. Residents implicitly finance a portion of their training through their labor contribution. The problem is that opportunities to do this are scarce in places where residents and attendings are more prevalent, such as large metropolitan areas. In short, it's more expensive to train residents where there are already a lot of doctors and residents because their labor contributions are less impactful. It would be better to train residents in places where there's more demand for medical services relative to the existing supply. The current system also incentivizes hospitals to open specialized residency programs instead of primary care residencies, since due to the nature of primary care interventions, these specialties usually generate far less revenue for sponsoring institutions compared to the more specialized and procedure-heavy specialties. With these issues in mind, we may be beyond the point where simply throwing more money at the problem will fix it. For this reason, some states are trying to address the issue of unmatched physicians and physician shortage from a different angle. Five states, including Arizona, Missouri, Arkansas, Kansas, and Utah, are trying to utilize unmatched physicians to help address their own doctor shortages. What these states are doing is allowing medical school graduates who have completed step one and step two, but not completed residency, to temporarily serve as assistant physicians and practice as a primary care physician in an underserved area in collaboration with a licensed physician. Under this agreement, unmatched physicians are able to utilize their knowledge and skills by working in a similar capacity to a nurse practitioner or physician assistant. Although this approach may help address the issue of unmatched physicians in the short term, it doesn't solve the bigger problem at hand, which is the residency bottleneck. Just as in medicine, there is certainly value in treating the symptoms. However, it doesn't do your patient much good unless you solve the underlying disease. Given the issues with the current structure of residency programs in the US, solving these issues will require much more than just throwing money at the problem. If we hope to fix a broken residency system and address the issue of physician shortage, then we're gonna to need to take a critical look at the system as a whole to address these underlying issues. Only then will we be able to meet the growing demand for physicians in the United States. All right, my friends, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out why every specialty seems competitive or the top five most competitive doctor specialties on the Med School Insiders channel. Much love and I'll see you guys there.